I'm in a city which, in its heyday, was the most active cultural and commercial centre in the Mediterranean. And one of the most volatile. During the 17th century, before the unification of Italy, Naples was part of the Spanish Empire. It was three times the size of Rome, with a population that had tripled over the century due to an influx of immigrants looking for work. One of these immigrants was an extraordinary painter who came here, like many others, to chase lucrative commissions. This is the Museo de Capodimonte in Naples. Originally built as a hunting lodge for the Spanish nobility, it now houses one of the finest art collections in Italy. Nestling among these official masterpieces is a breathtaking painting not even mentioned in the museum's highlights, even though it was created by someone quite exceptional in the history of art. This is one of the most arresting paintings I've ever seen. It's a moment of traumatic violence, captured with almost forensic intensity in the detail here. What is happening is that a woman is cutting a man's head off, and she's putting an enormous amount of effort into it, and yet she is doing it with a certain amount of disdain, though she's just getting on with the job she has to do. What is really frightening about it, and is appallingly strong, is that the man is still just alive. Despite the fact that the sword is stuck into his neck, his, his arm is shot up there, the fist is being held by the accomplice of the woman. You can see his mouth, who's always just crying out his last breath, but she is quietly and efficiently doing the business. What's so extraordinary about this huge, violent painting is that it was painted by a woman. Her name was Artemisia Gentileschi. A brilliant and mercurial painter, a charismatic trickster, a gifted businesswoman, a caring mother with a turbulent love life, and a modern woman in a patriarchal world. She's been sidelined for centuries. Now she's emerging from the shadows as one of the most exciting Baroque artists. Despite much of her work being lost or missing, and many details of her extraordinary story forgotten, there remain new and surprising discoveries to be made. Sixteenth century Rome where Artemisia was born over 400 years ago, was dominated by the Vatican, using art and architecture to dazzle its citizens with the power of the Catholic Church. The daughter of Orazio Gentileschi, one of Rome's many struggling painters, Artemisia lived with her family in the notorious artist quarter of the city. Would this have been teeming with people in Artemisia's day? The way absolutely, it is now. absolutely, even more so, because this was the northern door to Rome, yeah. because that was the place to be at the yeah, time. Such a demand, yeah. yes. <laughs> French novelist Alexandre Lapierre fell under Artemisia's spell when she came to Rome on a research trip. What she unearthed so intrigued her, she moved here to find out more. Another fine church, and there yes. are the Caravaggios yes. in there. It's right there. Yeah. Entries in the records of this church, Santa Maria del Popolo, suggest it was the local place of worship for Orazio Gentileschi and his wife Prudencia. What was the significance of this church in, in Artemisia's life? Oh, it, it has a very big significance because yeah. it is where her mother was buried mm. uh, when she was 12. How did the mother die? Uh, childbirth. Oh. Uh, many women died in childbirth in the yeah. 17th century. And Orazio, who loved his wife dearly, had ordered a true big service. He had made sure that his wife, Prudencia, would mm. get the best of it. Mm. So he ordered the burial to be by the chapel mm. that was the most visible at the time, mm -hmm. which was the Serazi chapel. Yeah. 
there would be singing, there would be candles. Candles were very precious. In the floor here, you will see rosas, which have holes, mm -hmm. and you would have poles that would open the, ah. the, the whole floor, yeah. the marble floor yeah. of the church, yeah. and you would bring down the corpse. Prudentia's sudden death would change Artemisia's life forever. At the age of 12, she became surrogate mother to her three younger brothers, as well as assisting her father in his studio. Orazio Gentileschi was a friend and follower of Caravaggio, whose formidable paintings loomed over his beloved wife's resting place. The Caravaggios, which she would have seen probably during the funeral, but every time she came here. Yes. I mean, they must have had quite an effect on her, do you think, as an oh, artist? Oh, yes, they are very strong. Caravaggio's revolution has changed the whole mm. of Orazio's mm. vision. Caravaggio is painting people from the street. Yes. So this... And that's a complete change, really, Complete change. Yeah. Mm. The idea is that the people looking at it, at, at the painting, can recognize themselves yeah. in the drama yeah. which is being played that's, on the that's screen. That's the powerful thing. Humanity yeah. is holding the whole yeah. frame, that the whole picture. Absolutely, I can imagine ah, yes. for a young girl or young child, I'm mean, looking up at that thinking, Absolutely, wow. but as a result, it has changed the whole vision of the art world mm. at the time. So that's really a lot for her to, to, to absorb. absorb yeah. And to find a way, because without a woman to direct her, without mm. a mother to direct her, mm. she's the only woman among a men men's world. Let's go and have okay. a closer yeah. look, shall we? Caravaggio and his followers drew on Rome's dark underbelly to inspire their cutting-edge style. By night, the city transformed itself into a den of vice and crime which thrived in backstreet taverns and behind closed palazzo doors. This was the residence of Beatrice Cenci. Inside this house, her wicked and horrible and terrible father, Francesco, abused her. So the legend goes. Nobody listened to her pleas when she was asking for help. But please follow me and don't be afraid. You're gonna be safe with me, I hope. Please come with me. Artemisia grew up in a patriarchal culture where women were the property of men. Seen as either virtuous or sinful, a loss of virginity outside marriage could mean joining the swelling ranks of prostitutes who haunted Rome's dark alleyways, along with the restless ghosts of its violent past. Who was the wicked girl who had killed her father? All the people of Rome went in the streets in this area, ready to go to the river where her head would be chopped off. Terrific. Thought that so, would happen. Now please follow me, we <laughs> go to the river to see happen. the place. <laughs> One of these ghosts is that of poor Beatrice Cenci, whose execution the young Artemisia almost certainly witnessed. Public decapitations, brutal and bloody, would have been part of daily life in Seicento, Rome. Her head was cut off with a sword, and all the blood went into the Tiber, dyeing it in color red. Artemisia's father, Orazio, all too well aware of the dangers for his only daughter, confined her to his studio, where she began to produce work of her own. Artemisia used the time to develop her talent, but always under her father's guiding hand. Some of their work is on display here at the Sparda Gallery in Rome. Well, here they are, side by side, the two Gentileschis, Orazio the father 
Artemisia, the daughter, and it's just interesting to compare and contrast the two. This is a painting I love. It's a beautiful, delicate painting. And this is by Artemisia, Madonna and Child. And she was a, she was a teenager when she painted this. And yet there's something about the delicacy with which the baby's hand, which is beautifully drawn, just touches the throat. Extraordinary gentle gesture, and the eyes looking at the closed eyes of Madonna. On the other side, a more classical picture, uh, by Orazio, it's David and Goliath, and it, it feels like a much bigger picture. The figure's very strong in frame. And you can see similarities, the sort of flesh tones, the angle of the body. You can see a strength in that painting and perhaps a delicacy, but also a sort of substance in this one here. And what you can also see, actually, is to be able to paint and model drapery like that is very, very impressive indeed. And her father, a much more well-known painter at the time, uh, a male painting in the classical idiom. And we can see down in the corner there the head of Goliath being zonked by the, the stone from the catapult. And it's almost a sort of uh, Gentileschi uh, trademark, the head somewhere in the painting. But altogether, a big, strong picture. And this picture, strong because of its delicacy. Both Artemisia's Madonna and this other striking painting of hers in the collection have until recently been wrongly attributed to male artists or to her father. The paintings of Artemisia's that I've seen today have been a revelation. Of course, the fact that such accomplished work could be created by someone so young has inevitably raised a few questions. Her father was a painter. What was his work? What was her work? Where's the real Artemisia? It's like this wonderful piece of visual trickery by Baroque architect Francesco Borromini. This arcade is actually only eight metres long. And the statue is only 70 centimetres high. It was indeed a world of riddles and illusions. The Susanna is her first really known work. It's signed with her name, Artemisia Gentileschi, 1610. And lots of scholars have argued, well, Orazio really painted it. He just put his daughter and his name on it to, you know, launch her career. And I don't think that's really true. I think he may have helped her with you know, the, the finishing of the picture, the sort of passages here and there, because his, his style is very difficult to distinguish from hers at that point. But the concept of that Susanna yeah. is radically new. Most of the Susannas of that period, all of them that I know by male artists, were almost betrayals of the story, because, you know, Susanna in the garden is bathing, and these elders thunder in, and they're going to rape her or have their way with her. And in most of the pictures you see, she's looking seductively at them, you know, Oh, you're coming to rape me? Okay, fine. But this is the first one. She's saying no, mm. no. And the face is rather horrified and shocked. Yeah. Well, this is the first time anybody ever painted that subject from Susanna's point of view. Mm. I mean, we, we never saw what women felt like in that situation in art before. For me, that's, that's a radical step in art history. It was also a case of art imitating life, like Susanna. Artemisia was being watched. One man with his eye on her was Agostino Tassi, a widower in his 30s. He was a highly sought after painter specializing in trompe l'oeil illusion, which was all the rage at the time. This dusty track in the built up center of Rome was once a shaded walkway through the ancient gardens of Sallust, fabled for their beauty and tranquility. The last 400 years has been the site of the Villa Aurora. Caravaggio, Henry James, Woody Allen and Madonna all came to the villa in part to see the work of Agostino Tassi. Ah, Greetings. Principessa. Hello, How nice Michael. to meet you. What oh, a thrill to meet nice. you. Well, Please call me Rita. Rita, I'm interested in this man, Agostino Tassi. But right. you've got some of his work here. We do. Can you show them to me? Because I'm really anxious to know what this man was like. So which is Tassi's work here then, the ceiling? Uh, on the ceiling, this is considered Guercino's masterpiece. 
the mythical oh. goddess of Aurora bringing dawn into the night, this Titonus, the Prince of Troy, behind her. Ah, oh, the central and that, part. Yes, yeah. in the central part. And that's in a Seiko, painted mm. on dry paint. Now, the frame, which is really a spectacular part of the painting yeah. as well, is by Agostino Tassi. Yeah. And he really was an illusionist, as you can see. Yeah. His part, the frame, has movement. It actually moves. If you move yeah. across the room, the columns move with you, yeah. and uh, they straighten, and then they curve in. Is it supposed to be a continuation of the house, the walls of the house? Of course it is. It's, it's it a is. continuation yeah. of the house. Yeah. And also, there's something very interesting here. You see how you see the breakthrough in the ceiling? Oh, yes. This caused a hue and an outcry in Rome. And they wanted Why? this painted over. But the first time, people were walking into the room, and they were hanging on the sides yeah. of the walls. And they said, we feel threatened. The sky feels like it's coming oh, down yeah. on us. It lifts you up, but also it is slightly scary. No, it does. It's a little yeah. scary, even today. But we have a fresco upstairs, La Fama. OK. Can I see that? Yes, absolutely. Oh, okay. Thank Please you. follow me. You're not too busy. <laughs> Tassi may have been a magician with oil, but in his private life, he was a skillful trickster. A known womanizer, Tassi's drunken brag was that he arranged the murder of his first wife as revenge for her infidelity. You know, we're in the process of restoring the house, so if it looks a bit uh, weathered, <laughs> that's why. But it's a labor of love. And, yeah. uh, we feel a tremendous responsibility to Well, there's a lot of feature regeneration. Long, beautiful work here. Now, th this is, gosh, that's Tassi again. We're yes, seeing his work La, here. Yes, it's La Fama. Again, Tassi framed one of Vicino's. These uh, curved sort of barleycorn columns are his work. Yes, these yeah. are the columns of Solomon. You'll see those yes. in St. Peter's. Okay. And then as you go around, the gold is 24 karat mm. gold uh, with which they paint. And uh, there is a different scene in each one of these alcoves. Yeah, because this is kind of quite subtle work. Beautiful work and such a modern for his, his time. Yeah. I mean, he was really thinking outside of the box in a sense. Yeah. And um, he was brilliant and his work was exquisite. Well, thank you. It's been absolutely eye-opening to see these work. He was quite brilliant, he, I think. He was a bit of a sort of he was a naughty, naughty boy. man. <laughs> he was yeah. naughty. It just but... adds to the sort of Mystic. the levels and the mystery of the story, really. Right, he could do such so beautiful too. work and yes. be pretty brutish. Exactly. A rising star, Agostino Tassi started painting for the Pope alongside his friend, Artemisia's father, Orazio. He became almost one of the family. Careful to hide away his teenage daughter from the corruption of the city, Orazio organized for her private art lessons with his friend, Agostino Tassi. What happened next is recorded forever in history. Although the exact facts are still hard to determine. Artemisia claimed that one spring afternoon in 1611, Tassie accosted her in her father's studio, followed her upstairs, and despite her pleas to be left alone, pushed her into the bedroom and raped her. the enraged Artemisia, and in an attempt to make good his violent act, Tassi promptly promised to marry her. With her precious virginity no longer intact and determined to keep the rape secret from her father, Artemisia had no choice but to accept Tassi's offer. It is a total disaster for the whole family, but nobody knows but Artemisia. Um, and so when Tassi comes back and abuse her again, now there is no other way than to obey. It's her man in that sense. And so it's going to go on like this for a few months where he says, it's okay, it's all right. I am straightening things up. But then one day, Orazio will find out. And what he will find out is going to incense him and drive him crazy. So this is all really difficult for everyone all round. I, I would think so. So Orazio reacts without really thinking by taking his pledge to the Pope. So he writes to the Pope not about his daughter's feelings or... No, about the fact that his goods, that is, Orazio's goods, 
has been destroyed, has been ruined. And so he asked reparation of something that has been done to him. It's n she's never considered as a, as a human being. In 1612, Orazio, to clear the family name, instigated legal proceedings against Tassi. It would go down as one of Rome's longest recorded rape trials. Here in Rome's state archive, a unique piece of evidence has recently been restored. It's around 300 pages long, and it could be the closest I can get to finding out what really happened between Artemisia and Tassi. Faithfully recorded by a court notary, the transcripts include, in Artemisia's own words, a remarkably detailed description of the rape. Io sentivo che mi incendeva forte e mi faceva gran male che io per l'impedimento che mi teneva alla bocca non potevo gridare. Pure cercavo di strillare meglio che potevo, chiamando Tuzia. Gli sgraffignai il viso e gli strappai i capelli e avanti che lo mettesse dentro anche gli detti una matta stretta al membro che gli ne levai anche un pezzo di carne. Con tutto ciò lui non stimò niente e continuò a fare il fatto suo. So very, very, very full strong. detail yeah. of a very violent rape. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't yeah. understand it all, but scratching yeah. the face yeah. and pulling yeah. the hair. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and she described a sexual relation yeah. here. Very violent. But very, very specifically yeah. written down. Yeah. With Roman justice at the time, there was no jury to decide. It was left to the judge, who used inquisitional techniques before proclaiming the final verdict in the name of God. In the justice of the 17th century, this is a rape. This is a rape because there was not a marriage there. Mm -hmm. And there was a relationship, sexual relationships, uh, between a man and a virgin woman. Mm -hmm. And this is a rape for the law. What was Tassi's response? Do you have that yeah. down there in the trial? Yeah. Tassi says he knows Artemisia, but he had never had sexual relations with her. And many witnesses could confirm that. And this is a drawing by Tassi. Io del mio mal ministro fui. I was guilty of my bad situation. Oh, well, um, and why did he do that? To the Sounds judge, in very... front of the judge. And the... Sounds like an admission of guilt. <laughs> Yes, but I think of my, I'm guilty, I'm a good man, I think about my, uh, about my violence, um, and yes, I can, I, can, yeah. uh, I can think about it. Oh, but I didn't do yes. the race. To add to the complication, we find elsewhere in the record Artemisia's statement that she slept with Tassie for almost a year before the trial believing that they would soon be married. Well, what's her attitude <laughs> so to him? She says that I was with him willingly, and in Italian she says amorevolmente, so with love. In Italian the word love is very important. Love is I trust, mm. I want to be with you. Mm. So it's very, very profound. Uh, and she used it, so we have to to recognize it. It's hard for anyone today to understand Artemisia's true feelings for Tassie. On the one hand, he was her abuser, but on the other, marriage to him would clear her name. Then sensational news reaches the court that despite Tassie's claims to the contrary, his wife is still alive. With marriage no longer an option, Artemisia's amour quickly turns to hate, perhaps reflected in the powerful work that she was painting at the time. 
in one sense, it is a kind of response. I mean, that way of depicting the subject so dramatically and graphically is a kind of getting back at Agostino Tassi in a public way. But this was a period when that was just understood. Why shouldn't she get revenge? She'd been wrong. But that wasn't all there was about that painting. She's the first woman, uh, first artist, perhaps, to have expressed in art what it feels like to be a woman victimized and a woman who fantasizes revenge for that victimization. Mm -hmm. This is this is expression on a grand scale. Yeah. So to, to to try to make it just about her one life, of course, it's made up out of her life in so many ways, but it goes farther than that. The trial had reached its tenth month. With both sides still proclaiming their innocence, the judge had one final method left to obtain the truth. In this case, he decides that Artemisia yeah, will be tortured. Yeah, he decides for the victim. We don't know why. Um, I have uh, my opinion about it, uh, because Agostino Tassi was painting for the Pope mm. in that period, mm. and it was very dangerous for the judge to destroy the hands of a painter of the Pope. And the judge decided for her the torture of the mm. Sibyls. Okay. How does that work? For her hands. Yes. And it was very dangerous because she was a painter, so yeah. uh, it was dramatic. This is a version of a rope. Oh, you have it's on, one there. It's, it's only a light. So the hand goes out. A light, yes, a right. light yeah. kind of seal yeah. this. OK. So it goes around each joint. Yeah, whoops. This is very, very light. Thank you. It's for Appreciate you. Appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so they're all pulled and together that, over the and joint. That. And then... Yes, and oh, so, yeah. OK. Oh, I can see, yes, yeah. Well, it stops the blood. Yeah. Right? Sort of, but, but that's quite <laughs> gentle. Was yeah, there, quite was gentle, there a, yes. What was the severe? Quite gentle, what was the not severe, severe for, and only yeah. for women. Only yeah. for women. Okay. Yeah. And there is a stronger, a stronger way yeah. for, for women, too. Yeah. And the drawing is that. Oh, this is a drawing of the oh, end of 16th century. Yeah. This is iron. Ah. This is wood. Oh, so that's using, instead of yes. rope, that's iron yes. and wood, which yes. would really could break your yeah. fingers. And only for women, because for men, the torture was stronger. By 17th century standards, it was certainly preferable to other common options, such as piercing, crushing, amputation, starvation or hanging. So, finally, after all this evidence, the torture, was there a conclusion? Yes, there was a conclusion, because Artemisia under torture said uh, that she was raped. So, that was the truth for the judge, and the judge will decide in this way. So, Agostino Tassi is guilty. <laughs> Against all odds, the Gentileschi had won. But as the shocking news of the trial outcome reverberated through the streets of Rome, the victory would be short-lived. Agostino Tassi's punishment was mild, a five-year exile from Rome, a sentence he never served. Whilst for Artemisia, the supposed victor, it was another story. She is dishonored forever. Everybody is laughing when she walks in the street. She is the woman that Agostino Tassi has had. Uh, she's completely finished as far as reputation is concerned. And the whole family, Gentileschi, is stained forever. So in a way, it's obviously fantastic because it is uh, proved that she saved mm. the truth. But the result is that she is a lost woman. So what was Artemisia to do then? No other choice or the convent or marriage, uh -huh. and it was here. Yeah. Oh well, let's have a look in. Armed with a hefty dowry and the promise of her lucrative potential as a painter, Orazio finally found a buyer for his daughter. On November the 29th, 1612, Artemisia was married here in Santo Spirito to a Florentine, Pier Antonio Stiatesi. 
And tell me about her husband. Did well, she know him? No. She had met him in the afternoon for the first time. The man was coming from Florence for the wedding. He was the younger brother of the lawyer that mm. had uh, helped her father yeah. in the case. But she has never seen him. And the luck will want that he's young and rather handsome and rather kind and not an old a man who they pulled out from God knows where. So she's rather surprised because the man she's marrying mm. is, is, seems okay. She's married here at night with all the door closed. The Gentileschi fear that at any moment the friends of Agostino Tassi and Tassi himself, who knows, could come here and just break the neck of Artemisia and also yeah. her husband-to-be. So the, the wedding is completely secret. Do we know yeah. who married them? The priest? We know, a friend? No, it was the priest of, of the okay. parish. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he himself was very nervous because it's completely against the law to close the door of a church during a, a wedding. You have to have all the door open mm. so that anybody who would say that oh. the person is already oh. married could come in. So where in the church did they get married? At the altar? Or? They did not get married. Uh, in front of the main altar, but they got married in a very small chapel, which is on the side with no one. Artemisia did not have a woman with her. You know, usually when you are the yes. bride, you have people the arrange you. Or something. Yes, yeah, something. Right. No one, just the future wife, the future husband, the father, and two witnesses. And strangely enough, at the beginning, it would be a true couple. It would be an association, a business association, because he takes care of. Um, dealing with the contracts and everything, and she paints and begins painting. So here her career really begins. If Rome was Artemisia's undoing, then Florence was to be the making of her. Assisted by letters of introduction from her father, Artemisia arrived here in Florence not long after her marriage. This was a second chance for her, an opportunity for her to shake off the stigma of the rape trial and rise again as a professional painter, but this time on her own terms. That is, so long as she stayed out of trouble. Seventeenth century Florence was a wealthy city of merchants and warlords, dominated by the Medici, a dynasty of bankers in the last throes of their reign. For the newly arrived Artemisia, illiterate and with a checkered past, finding the crucial patron she would need would not be easy. But Artemisia struck lucky. Her first break came from none other than Michelangelo Buonarroti the Younger, the great nephew of Michelangelo. Artemisia, both as a woman artist and an expert on the female nude, was to be the perfect choice for his new project. Artemisia's panel was called the Allegory of Inclination. That is to say, the female personification of a particular quality of the artist, Michelangelo. And so the inclination means he was destined to be a great artist by virtue of his birth. Did she come to Florence with a different attitude, having left Rome? Was this something new for her? Well, you might say she thought she had that inclination, you know. She, she too was uh, someone destined to be. She was fiercely ambitious, just fiercely ambitious. This is the most important thing about her, I think. And not just to succeed, not to be somebody who got great commissions and was known around Europe, that, that was true, but she really wanted to be a great artist. I mean, she, she got the concept from looking around her, this very place, you know, I think the, the idea almost was planted, if it hadn't been planted already, it, it was planted for her in the way that Michelangelo was celebrated. I mean, she really had that kind of goal in mind. She wanted to be a great artist, not just a great woman artist, a great artist yes. compared to yes. Michelangelo, yeah. Caravaggio, Orazio, certainly. A 
A canny strategist, Artemisia began to educate herself in music and literature, using her beauty and charm to move through the elite circles of Florentine society. But before she could achieve her ultimate goal of accessing the Medici court itself, she needed to produce work on a grander scale. Nicola? Hello, Michael. Hello. Hello. Very nice to you. Thank you very much. Nicola McGregor runs a painting workshop in the centre of Florence, along similar lines to the one Artemisia was assembling for her fledgling business. Would she have had assistants and a, and a workshop to run? On the large paintings and on fresco, she'd have definitely had assistants. Probably some that were very good at doing flesh tones, some that were very good at doing landscapes. I mean, the design obviously was hers, the drawing was hers, the ideas were hers. She probably mapped it out. You know, the last say is obviously by the artist. Although the vision was ultimately Artemisia's, much of her work does not bear her signature which has led to heated debates among scholars about what is and what is not by her hand. Most of the, her work was commissioned specifically. You know, they weren't painters that were just sitting in their studio painting and say, trying to find a buyer. They would have um, painted on commission. So, I mean, it was obvious if you commission a painting from Artemisia, you know, so there was no need to sign them. Artemisia didn't just have a business to run, she had a family too. Information recently discovered by Dr. Sheila Barker shows that she lived with her husband in this area, close to Sant'Ambrogio Church. It was during this time their first two children died. The third child who was baptized here yeah. is um, Cristofano, named after yeah. Of a painter that she was friends with and who was the godfather of the child. Yeah. So that's three children three you children. know for certain yeah. perished. Wow. Was this, um, was this in any way common at that time um, or was it very unusual to have uh, lose three children? I would say it's very bad statistics. To lose your first three children is quite unusual even in those times. While in Florence, Artemisia gave birth to one surviving daughter, whom she called Prudencia, after her late mother. Although touched by loss, Artemisia remained productive, making her way each day across the city to her workshop. So I suppose it's not changed a lot, Florence, has it? No, Let's not in the see. essential ways. Yeah, no. that's good. Well, Where? we're doing Artemisia's walk to work through Florence. Her daily commute. Yeah. Would she be with anybody or walking on her own? She would have been very careful to walk with a servant so that she would be seen as a great lady. And uh, oh, I see. Yes, the but, status was important. Very important. And of course, clothing would have been very important as a way of announcing her status as well. I can tell you from the the purchases she was making that it was perhaps her most important business decision. So what kind of outfits are we talking about here? Were these expensive dresses? Extremely expensive. She was dressing at the level of the ladies at court, and yet she didn't pay for any of this. She walked into the stores Fantastic. and took it all on credit. Yeah. I call it creative financing. OK. <laughs> <laughs> That's much more poetic. <laughs> With her eye always on the main chance, Artemisia made sure to pass through this square in her finest outfits, hoping to attract the attention of the wealthy residents of Santa Croce, with their contacts to the Medici court. The piazza is filled with the palaces of the wealthy silk merchants that she was contracting debts with. Artemisia sought out these uh, Cavalieri, these, these, these knights of Florence, because not only were they wealthy, but as knights, they would have been invited to all of the court festivals and they would have had the opportunity to mention this fantastically talented woman. They were happy to uh, be able to broker a relationship between her and the Grand Duke. That made them important. So as she's dressing the part of the heroines she paints, she becomes a kind of 
walking heroine. And she allows for these potential patrons to enter into this imaginary story. It was theater. She has prearranged in this one particular case to be in the home of a gold merchant that she was friends with. And the two of them have planned to be in a conversation just as a wealthy silk merchant walks in the door. Artemisia says to her friend, please loan me this money, I'm desperate for this money. And he responds, I wish I could, but I can't, I don't have the money. And who saves the day? The wealthy silk merchant walking in the door sees a woman in distress and he offers to loan her the money. So she was an actress. She was a consummate actress, it sounds like, She was too. a script writer as well. <laughs> yeah. So he loans her the money, and of course she didn't pay it back. She gave him a painting in exchange. Music and art were the vocabulary that was shared by all of these refined gentlemen, and Artemisia made a point of learning that vocabulary. It would seem that Artemisia's strategy paid off. Many of her works can be found amongst the priceless treasures of the Pitti Palace. By painting popular historical themes, Artemisia fully developed a style of her own whilst maintaining one of her most loyal and influential patrons, Cosimo II de Medici. What strikes me so powerfully about this painting is the moment of drama it captures. And this is a very dramatic moment in the story of the beheading of Holofernes. The deed has been done, they're about to leave the tent, and something has made them stop. And the way Artemisia's captured Judith's face there, you can see that she's, what she's done, sort of a uh, slight flushing of the cheeks and the, the damp curls on the head, you know what she's been through her mouth just slightly open, waiting, listening, that someone might discover them. And you can see the servant there looking off to one side. But really, Artemisia has made Judith the center of attention in this painting. Even the way the light source comes in, it comes on her neck and her breast and reminds us this is a woman who has done this deed. You know, she's not, not, uh, you know, not apologizing for femininity, celebrating it, but she's had to do this deed. And the great thing is that the head of Holofernes is almost like an afterthought. There it is, down the bottom of the painting, rather like they've just got it from the supermarket. There's a certain sense in which every artist is always in every work. And it's something that's been attributed to Cosimo de' Medici in the 15th century. Every artist paints himself. And in a sense, Artemisia is always painting herself, so you, she's in it. Mm. But she's in the character. It doesn't mean the character can be reduced to that particular person. To me, that, that's an important distinction. Mm. She helps to give that character reality. Mm. Artemisia flourished in Florence. Most significantly, she created a series of complex female protagonists. It seems to me Artemisia might have used her own tragic experiences, the loss of her mother, her rape, and the premature death of her children, to breathe life into the wronged women of history, the likes of Cleopatra, Lucretia, Bathsheba, and Mary Magdalene. The Magdalene, for example, was a tainted woman who became redeemed by virtue of her conversion to follow Christ. So these characters have, even when they're good, they, you know, they, they have a dimension of complexity mm -hmm. that's not always captured in art. It, it tends to be either or. Artemisia gives them that dimensionality, so there's a kind of deeper psychology in her characters. She depicted their suffering, captured their longing, and understood their tangled moral dilemmas, transforming them from victims into survivors. Her time in the city had, in fact, been a triumph professionally. 
culminating in the highest honour an artist could receive, membership of the Academy of Drawing and Arts. Artemisia was one of the first women to receive such public recognition and proof of her inclination as a great painter. Never one to stay out of trouble for long, Artemisia's own reality was becoming slightly complicated. By 1620, estranged from her husband and behind with her commissions, Artemisia decided to leave Florence in search of new adventures. The dramatic backdrop of Naples would become home to Artemisia for the last act of her life. After a decade of travel through the great cities of Europe as a fated lady artist, she finally made her base in this Spanish-ruled city with 450,000 inhabitants and 500 churches crammed inside its old walls, which of course meant wealthy patrons and abundant church commissions. Artemisia's stay in Naples was in marked contrast to her time in Rome and Florence. The narrow streets of the Spanish Quarter were full to bursting with a recent surge of immigrants. Within a year of her arrival here, Mount Vesuvius erupted spectacularly, killing thousands along the coast. There were even rumours that incoming artists were being poisoned by indigenous painters for stealing their commissions. By now, Artemisia was a seasoned survivor. Her clever stratagems and business prowess meant she quickly established new patrons here, whilst being careful to keep up her old contacts from a distance. And she's got some quite impressive friends. Galileo was someone she wrote to in 1635, Galileo Galilei. And she writes to him as a friend, my most illustrious sir and most respected master, and then proceeds on, on to a bit of a whinge about uh, someone who's not paid up. From his most serene highness, my natural prince, Ferdinando II, I've received no favor. I assure your lordship that I would have valued the smallest of favors from him more than the many I've received from the King of France, the King of Spain, the King of England, and all the other princes of Europe. So he's quite good at dropping a few names. A letter here in 1636 to Andrea Gioli in Florence. He was um, attached to Cosimo Medici. He was a sort of secretary to the court there. And in this, you really hear her, her spirits dropping a bit. I have no further desire to stay in Naples, both because of the fighting, tumulti di guerra, and because of the hard life and the high cost of living. Please be so kind as to reply to me, since I have no other desire in this life. So it's Again, touch of the drama there, touch of the drama queen, which is always, always part of Artemisia's approach. Apart from these letters, there's very little information about Artemisia's life in Naples. What we do know is that the only time she did leave this turbulent city was for two years in London, where she added Charles I to her contact book. And it was there she buried her father, Orazio, who'd been working in England as a court painter. The few pieces that have survived from her Neapolitan period show a variable output, producing an acknowledged masterpiece, an innovative self-portrait now in the British Royal Collection. But also more commercial work with a softer edge. Did she see herself as a brand in Naples? After 1630, the whole artistic milieu in Italy changes. Caravaggio's revolution had been the radical turning point of the, of the Italian art and probably of the European art in many respects, but it was a very uh, sort of short spark. And after that, the Baroque came out with new uh, issues and new instances, and she changes her style like many other painter, painters of her time. So she becomes also very Neapolitan in some respects. She uses the palette and the colors of the Neapolitan artists. She probably abandons the dark lighting of the early works. On one hand, she used to collaborate with prominent masters of the local artistic milieu, like Stanzione or Cavallino. 
On the other hand, she used to produce quite a number of versions executed at varied, uneven and different degrees of quality in order to satisfy cheaper orders, cheaper commissions. We know Artemisia continued to paint into her 60s, but how and when she died is still a mystery. One theory is that she was claimed by the Great Plague of 1656, which swept through Naples. But like much of her history, the details have been lost over the centuries which separate her from us. But as another chapter opens in the city of her greatest triumphs, Artemisia Gentileschi could be coming a little closer. One of Artemisia's large-scale commissions has been discovered in the attics of the Pitti Palace in Florence. Part of a mission by modern-day patron Jane Fortune to rescue neglected artworks by women. There are 2,000 works of art by women that we found that have been languishing there for centuries. And the Artemisia Gentileschi had been there for 363 years. It was in deplorable condition. It had uh, the humidity, there had once been a hole in the roof and the rain had come down on it. So when we saw it, most of the paint had come off. I mean, it was, there were just chunks of pieces where you didn't see anything. And there was a question as to whether they should restore it or not because it was in such deplorable condition. I said, it's an Artemisia Gentileschi. You know, she's one of the finest, most, uh, painters in the world, man or woman. She's one of the best. You cannot let this painting die. And, and that's what it was going to do, it would just die. The onerous task of restoration fell to Nicola McGregor's conservation workshop. It was a huge project because of the size of the painting to begin with and because of the amount of damage and not only the amount of missing areas, but also the parts of the colour that were still there had obviously been cleaned and re-cleaned. A lot of the final glazes were no longer there. Mm. So it didn't have the rounded finish mm. that most post caravaggesque paintings have and her other paintings. Can you describe what would be the process of dealing with a, an Artemisia painting in a, in a bad state? you have to decide whether it needs, the colour needs consolidating immediately so that you can touch it or move it, or very often it needs cleaning first, a very gentle cleaning, because sometimes there's a lot of old retouching that covers the original paint. And of course one forgets that a painting has a life of its own. Over the years it's been repainted and touched up and changed in many different shapes and forms. Uh, yes, I mean, usually, most of the paintings I've worked on have had, like the Artemisia, have had four or five different filling layers, which meant that over the years, yeah. it had been um, restored repeatedly. They did restore it, but it's very controversial how they did it, because they didn't paint over like they normally do with paintings. What they did is they, they did muted colors, the blues and the tans, and filled in the spots that were where we're missing the paint. And so what happens is, when you stand away from the painting, you, your eye makes it look like the painting is full. When you come up to the painting, you can see where it's been filled in. We couldn't repaint the eye. We wanted to keep it consistent so that what was left of Artemisia would emerge. It's an amazing piece, it's an amazing piece. And when they did it, they could not find David in the painting. And it was about a week or so before we were going to show the painting to the public and they were cleaning up in this little corner and here's David, this little teeny, teeny, teeny picture of David and everybody was so excited we found David. So. <laughs> This rediscovery is now part of an ongoing quest to define Artemisia's output, culminating tonight in an international conference of academics, writers and fans from all over the world who have come here to talk Artemisia. 
to me, Artemisia is so interesting because she, she's like a chameleon. She's uh, so often hidden under all the names and other you know, artist names. And, after, and as she comes after uh, scrutiny, she comes to be one, a, a very um, unpredictable artist at, at, yeah. at times. That's why I like her. You have a feeling with this ridiculous feeling. You, you know her in some way, or she, she is telling you something. You just have to respond in yeah. some way. It becomes character. a very personal artist exactly. for a lot that's of people. That's why. I think so. Yeah. I think Please people respond very personally to her. They mm. feel they know her. I think she speaks particularly for women to some aspect of their lives. She, they want to champion her, and as they do, yeah. they champion themselves. I, I think there's a lot to that. Is there still a lot of information to be gathered on Artemisia, archives to be unlocked. It's still a mind to be yeah. explored. You know, we only have these sort of individual slices of moments in her mm -hmm. life. Someday maybe we'll have a more yeah. wide picture of the whole life. In her keynote speech, world expert Mary Garrard highlights a disturbing new trend in attribution. The Artemisia discourse has also generated sharp disagreements over attributions among scholars and curators even between co-curators, with the result that Artemisia's artistic identity is far from fixed or agreed upon. More and more works are turning up in recent exhibitions and on the market, which are pretty questionable as attributions to Artemisia, and with the result, really, that I think we used to have a much clearer sense of the oeuvre. Now we're being asked to accept things that either widen our understanding of what she was capable of, or really we should just raise our eyebrows and say that's not possible. Artemisia's name cannot be a wastebasket into which we dump images of women that do not remotely resemble those she painted, or even each other. Realistically, With Artemisia Gentileschi paintings now selling for over a million dollars, and with around half of what she produced still missing, it's no wonder that so many works of dubious quality and provenance are emerging from the woodwork. We can account for this tremendous range of works that don't look much alike by the fact that she was a kind of chameleon. She was out to please her patrons. But to say that she, you know, she did that all the time and that's why none of these things look like each other is to, to take away all her artistic identity completely and say she didn't have any core. She didn't have any sort of, and I don't think that's plausible on the basis of the works that we know. She was too strong and too determined and too coherent a, yeah. a, a personality, an artist, for that to be the case. Not only was she a woman in a man's world handicapped by gender, rather she was an artist with an edge whose legacy is ours to recover and preserve. Thank you. My quest for Artemisia is almost over. Let's hope that having finally found a fuller picture of this unique artist, we're not in danger of losing her again. Artemisia Gentileschi was a force of nature. You can see it in her paintings, the best of which combine physical energy and emotional engagement. You can also see it in the subjects she chose, very often the wronged women of history, Susanna, Cleopatra, Lucretia, Judith. And she didn't treat them as victims, but as people in control of their own destiny. And you can see it in her own life. Artemisia was a survivor. She was a cool operator who never compromised her sexuality or her femininity. In fact, she used them both to create a whole new way of looking at women in art. Very nice to see you. Yeah, excellent. Excellent.